want to start by thanking you all um, so much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a great, great honor. Um, what I'm going to share is here attributed to myself, but as much of our work uh, reflects a collaborative team uh, effort. So um, I'm going to start by um, giving an overview of kind of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to introduce this idea of biolinguistic anthropology. Um, next, I'll share some research on um, emotion communication in everyday interaction um, grounded in an ethnographic approach. And uh, then I'll discuss uh, how we might be able to expand a biolinguistic approach beyond the dyad of couple. And um, I'm gonna invite you all to join my lab that I have going on or our lab that we have at UA. So this work is very much grounded in biocultural medical anthropology and linguistic anthropology. So biocultural, um, according to the UA Anthro website, strives to understand why people grow and develop as they do and why they may be at risk for health problems and has a very applied focus on um, addressing inequities and contributing to lasting cultural change in terms of health, healthcare, and human development. Linguistic anthropology, as described by the SLA website, um, strives to understand the ways in which language shapes and is shaped by social life, from face-to-face -face interaction to global level phenomenon. What is less well known is that Linganth also has an applied focus that is very similar, and yes, I borrowed this language um, intentionally addressing inequities and contributing to lasting cultural change in terms of language. So for example, addressing biases related to dialect or accent across multiple sites. Um, so biocultural anthropology is compelling because of the ways in which um, it seeks to understand both how the world becomes embodied and how people body the world, right? Understanding the effect of uh, society and social interactions on the body over time and social configurations. I would say there's, there's less of an emphasis on specific interactions and more of a, a, a broad focus on, for example, um, poverty, mar marginalization, things over time, um, racialization and how that, how that impacts the body, right? But also there is a, an understanding of a desire to understand how people body the world, how to quote Carol Worthman, uh, embodiment exerts force on as well as in culture. So that the embodiment um, that comes from genetics or epigenetics or um, metabolic you know, uh, configurations or whatever, however we're resourced at that day affects the way in which we body the world. And the key thing here is that biocultural research really aims for bi-directionality in terms of embodiment and world. Um, in practice, however, and I'm quoting DeCaro 2022, personal communication, uh, the, the theories and methods at hand for biocultural medical anthropologists often center unidirectional analyses. Usually, for example, in anthropology, it is frequently how the world becomes embodied. Is, is more of the focus. Whereas in other disciplines, you have you know, the neural underpinnings of, so that you have more of an emphasis on understanding the embodied mechanisms by which we body the world, right? So that, so that the, the idea of bi-directionality is there, but it's very difficult to achieve. So embodiment and interaction in linguistic anthropology we really focus on embodiment in the immediate interaction in terms of eye gaze, prosody, like our tone of voice, the, the gestures, um, the, the way we sit, the way we stand, the way we move, all of those things are really key to understanding um, interaction as what Chuck Goodwin calls co-operative action. Um, the dash being there to distinguish it from cooperation always, right? So that we can have cooperative action in a conflict uh, as well as, a, um, as, as, an, as an agreement, right? So to build cooperative action, uh, Goodwin writes, participants create 
creating changing contextual configurations, which in, within which they attend as relevant to the detailed organization of emerging talk, the different kinds of displays made by each other's bodies and phenomena in the surround so that we're constantly shifting um, the way we respond uh, based on all of this data, right? That we're, that we're taking in about not just our interlocutor, but about the air temperature or the quality of the air or um, our own you know, state of um, hunger, which is what I will say in a second, is not so much the focus in a lot of linguistic anthropology. Um, but it, it is the focus to say, um, to take a, a, a lived experience perspective on the phenomenology of language um, and to say that language is encountered and lived through as something emerging through time, moment by moment, as an unfolding, mutable process. Language, in all, its, in all its richness, is something actually experienced. So the key thing here is that when we're talking about language, and thank you to uh, Constantine Nikasis for writing this 2016 review article that was um, entitled "Not the Study of Language." Right. One of the one of the things that in 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 historical uh, linguistic anthropology has been emphasized is our actual words and myths and the the tracking of different grammars. Um, in uh, contemporary linguistic anthropology, we we do study language, but uh, we orient to the notion that meaning is always construed by particular people in specific interactions that themselves are constrained and mediated by history, ideologies, and broad structures of power. So again, quoted Goodwin, our lived experience of emerging language is typically shaped within a larger ecology of mutually elaborating resources that include our own bodies, the time-bound bodies of others, and relevant structures in the environment. And, and, and that structure may be the design and layout of a, a lecture hall or a courtroom. Or and and that within that you have you have um, you can reach through the concept of indexicality, which is why there's a fire here. If anyone has studied uh, purse, the uh, there's there's a symbol which is an arbitrary um, label for something, and then there's an index, which is really how we apprehend language in interaction, uh, in the way that smoke indexes fire. So a closed door indexes. Uh, the person is not there, or it indexes their, you know, if you think of a faculty office with a closed door, but their light is on, it indexes that they're in a meeting or that they're not available. That the idea of, of, of publicness and, and privacy are something that we can see through indexes. And uh, how we get from immediate micro interactions to broad structures of power, for example, is um, is in looking at the layout, for example, of a courtroom and, um, and the underlying ideologies, the indexicalities that prevail there is the, the, the higher, you know, that the, the judge sits higher, right? So that indexes more authority and, and, and on and on and on. So we're always indexing um, in everyday interactions. So that's how it's not the study of specific words, but it's how, how that meaning um, collaboratively emerges in sometimes very different ways for different interlocutors. So in biocultural, you know, what's really exciting is that biology is really much more than structure and function, right? As, and to understand culture as biopsychosocial is a, is, a, is a great intervention, but less emphasized is of course interaction. And in Linganth, um, language is much more than words. Meaning is simultaneously situated and indexical of shared uh, ideologies or unshared or differently um, distributed ideas. Uh, less emphasized is human biology. So, you know, early in um, upon coming to UA, where there is a, a strength in biocultural medical anthropology, as a medical and linguistic anthropologist, I just, we just, um, several of us in the department sat down and we're like, wow, this is really a, a great a place for potential collaboration. Um, and so therefore we have formulated a biolinguistic anthropology as, um, as a cross subfield mixed method approach to understanding how culture, biology and experience co-emerge in moment to moment interaction as well as over time. And um, the, the data that I will share, um, I'm not even 
looking at my notes, <laughs> um, the data that I will share comes from um, an NSF senior that was awarded in 2017 with uh, myself and Jason DeCaro and, and Josh Peterson, who's in communication studies, which was great. So it's truly interdisciplinary and cross subfield. Um, and this study involved um, open-ended ethnographic interviews with the N is 24, 24 couples, why 24 COVID? <laughs> need I say more, but that's what we got to, um, who um, had been together for at least one year. And it, it also included individual interviews with each partner um, and eight to, roughly eight to 10 hours of video recording over the course of three to five days in couples' homes. And throughout, we used um, physiological um, monitoring um, using a um, mobile device called the Mindware, which, um, which uh, is a mobile impedance cardiography unit, if I said that right, Jason, I think I said that, <laughs> um, that measures heart rate variability. And um, we also included the assessment of cortisol levels um, in the collection of daily saliva and then one hair sample um, from each partner. And um, from communication studies, Josh uh, developed a uh, integrated scale survey um, that assesses relationship quality um, with every couple. And so the current analysis really um, focuses on time matched HRV, so our variability and video data with a specific focus on shifts in respiratory sinus arrhythmia values. So RSA um, reflects the parasympathetic process of de arousal or the braking system in response to sympathetic nervous system nervous system arousal. So if we're really um, triggered by something, um, that would probably be the sympathetic nervous system. And then the parasympathetic is what sort of brings us back online, so to speak, in terms of being, um, being able to regulate and calm and not, um, not continually freak out. <laughs> Um, so that's that's what's key is that lower RSA in the charts that I will show is a higher arousal. So that's that's one of the things that's hard to sometimes get. So this study um, really focuses. Um, I want to share on a recent study we just concluded, um, an investigation, um, which uh, focused on intimacy and and the idea of um, intimacy in uh, multiple disciplines is something that that we looked at. Um, and you have from, uh, from relationship studies, um, I think this person is a psychologist, if I'm correct, I'm not um, sure that Josh, Josh added this study, but it was really interesting to see that intimacy is a personal, subjective, and often momentary sense of connectedness. So a very phenomenological individual notion of what intimacy is. Um, whereas my own work in linguistic anthropology as the work of several others, um, reflects intimacy as a discursive and relational process that involves both closest, closeness and distance and has to be made and remade in specific interactional moments. So it's not actually, these are just different aspects and ways of looking at intimacy. Um, from a cultural anthropology or psychological anthro approach, um, intimacy has been investigated as a process that is both culturally situated and socio-historically mediated and has also been looked at as a regime, right? So uh, Rosniel et al. talk about how the couple norm defines what it is to be a citizen, a fully recognized and rights-bearing member of society. And so a lot of this other work um, in cultural anthropology looks at how intimacy prevails, oops, that's a typo, in the relationships people have with the state. Right, so that the, the kind of intimate violence that is exerted upon bodies by state actors um, or the intimacy that we may feel um, with nationalistic ideas. And so, so that's a very different understanding of, of intimacy. Um, in the physiology of intimacy, um, the, the fundamental orientation, and I think a lot of the talks here have reflected that, of uh, that all interaction is a physiological experience, right? Breath, heart rate variability, lots of other biological processes are co-regulated, right, in interaction. 
Um, but specifically in the relationship studies literature, there is this interesting debate about how patterns of in-phase and anti-phase synchrony or asynchrony contribute to relationship satisfaction over time in romantic couples. So of course you have um, this, uh, this idea of synchronization. And I think a lot of the literature as being something that reflects connection, empathy, it's something that we kind of are excited to see, this brain coupling. Um, so you have this kind of in-phase synchrony. Um, in some of the studies, they've shown that leader-follower kind of game playing um, creates this anti-phase synchrony where like you go up, I go down, right? In relationship studies, it's very interesting. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll take um, couples and, and do um, a measurement of HRV in the lab. And there've been other physiology studies, but just in, in terms of the HRV stuff, and they'll look at um, whether, whether couples who have a higher quality relationship um, tend to veer towards, um, towards more in-phase or anti-phase synchrony. And there's, a, there's some really interesting debates that I feel like are very much infused with people's ideologies of how to do emotion, uh, do, how to do intimacy well, right? it's better to balance your partner out or it's better to be um, empathic and to be with your partner. And, um, and so this is something that we are sort of uh, um, uh, agnostic <laughs> about to the extent that, that um, we're not really focusing on what constitutes good or bad intimacy. Um, and that's not you know, that's not our goal here, even though we did assess relationship quality. So the data, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show two short clips um, that were chosen by researchers, open to questions later, if you have, have, have questions about why these were chosen, um, either GRAs or ourselves, um, who chose a fairly typical interaction for three couples. Um, and we then went and took, the 10 minutes of surrounding RSA data. So um, for those who have worked with HRV, the 10 minutes makes sense, um, but it may not, um, given that the focal interactions were one to three minutes, um, because RSA is computed based on cyclical changes in heart rate that unfold, unfold in conjunction with respiration, um, to meaningfully observe patterns, we needed as many data points as possible this is why the 10 minutes is the golden rule. Like you don't want anything smaller. You need a, you need a, a longer period of time. So we took the five, roughly five minutes before the focal interaction and then, and then went on um, after. And um, each interaction is compared to, and I'm not necessarily gonna go into this too much, but I think it's important to point out what we did was we took a randomized sampling of RSA values for 10 minutes um, at three um, chosen times per day per couple. So it was like at, at, at the, big, the end of the last 10 minutes of hour one, the last 10 minutes of hour two, and the last 10 minutes of hour three. It was, it was different times every day, so we couldn't designate specific times, but we wanted to um, see what we were, what, what was happening in the synchrony, asynchrony, antiphase, and phase, what was happening physiologically in these random moments. Um, but our aim here was to investigate, and really as a, as a exploratory investigative study, um, how might we be able to understand the pragmatic co-emergence of both emotion and physiological activity, um, and perhaps more broadly intimacy in particular interactions as they are situated in time. And so, um, so our first couple is uh, Gloria and Wesley. They are a black middle-class Christian couple in their late thirties. Um, they had been married for about five years when the study was conducted. Um, and they, they had met and dated all through college. And um, uh, Wesley got cold feet the day before their wedding, uh, but they reconnected and time stood still and they've been together ever since. So 10 years later, so, that, so their, their history is much longer than this five years. Um, in their interview, Gloria and Wes told us how they both actively prioritize their marriage, um, frequently taking steps to learn how to deepen their connection through the cultivation of vulnerability, patience, compassion, and for Wesley especially, 
the development of skills in talking about feelings. So we heard from a lot of men that about, about this. Um, so on the three evenings we spent with them and I was there with a couple of GRAs and our uh, mindware and our two video cameras with mics. And so it's quite a bit happening in their homes. Um, so we, we, one of the things that we have kind of assumed is that the couples that are doing well, um, that, that all of the couples who are calling this number to have researchers in their homes for three days are, are, are fairly confident that they have good intimacy, right? These are not couples that are, that are gonna be falling apart. That could be a biased sample where it's just, uh, just, a, just a matter of pragmatics that we, that we have to understand. Um, but, uh, when we went in the evenings, both of them worked full time. So we were with them while they, um, prepared and ate dinner. And then they usually sat together on the couch to watch television. Um, ask me later about how much ethnography I've done of couples watching TV. Um, and they usually watched either The Bachelor or HGTV. And if you're studying intimacy and you want to enjoy ethnography watching television, I highly recommend couples who watch The Bachelor. The comments that they make say a lot about their relationship. Um, so the television though was frequently on while they prepared and ate dinner, providing a kind of background noise to which they each would orient from time to time. And then the, the overall observation was that they moved fluidly between moments of joint attention towards the television or towards immediate cooking related tasks such as finding the appropriate knife um, or deciding uh, on how long something needed to be thawed. So both also usually had their mobile phones with them on the couch and one or the other would frequently pick up their phone, check messages, scroll online or play a game. And the, inter the interaction we examined here occurred at precisely 7.15 p.m. on the third evening we were with them. They had eaten dinner and were seated on the couch uh, while a home renovation show played on the large screen directly across from them. Gloria, seated immediately to Wesley's right, was thoroughly engrossed in scrolling on her phone, and Wesley was in, uh, was absorbed in the show. So I'll play it for you. This is the transcripts you have now. The transcripts, for those who aren't familiar with the complex symbols, um, I have simpler transcripts coming after the video, so you don't have to worry about too many of the details, but if you are interested, there is a key. Um, one of the things in linguistic anthropology that we are very committed to is um, documenting intakes of breath, pauses, length of pauses, um, overlapping speech, and um, you know, rising intonation, quieter speech, faster speech. There's all these things that, that are at the, at the micro interactional level are become really, really important to understanding um, cooperative action. So I'll play this for you. I'm hoping we have sound too. So. You shouldn't have been like that. I've got to start working on what I'm wearing to work. You know, that takes me about two hours. I know I don't look like it every day, but it takes me forever. Eat them. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, the RSA. Um, so Gloria is represented with the solid line and um, the broken line is Wesley. And um, this is their RSA for the 10 minutes. And this is the focal interaction. Um, 
the overall correlation coefficient here is, uh, I think it was um, plus, you have it. <laughs> it, was, it was significantly uh, what we called flow. So that, that, that we were fairly, fairly confident in calling this, um, especially during the focal interaction in in-phase synchrony, an example of that. And, um, and so, well, Gloria, and, and this is, okay, so this is their, this is their random segments, and this just really roughly shows a far more variable. It's not like Gloria and Wesley are like this in, like they're this in tune, um, sort of co-regulated in phase synchronous couple all the time, right? That um, they, they're moving in and out of multiple types of in phase and antiphase. Synchrony. So that's that's an important background point that I want to um, kind of come back to. But in terms of this interaction and um, the in, the strong in phase linkage that we saw between Gloria and Wes's RSA values before, during, and after the focal interaction, right? So it's not a case where we see the focal interaction shifting something. So this was this was kind of a, a period of synchronization. Um, while Gloria and Wesley's interaction is clearly intimate, I don't think any of us would question that in terms of the way it involved touch and the sounds of pleasure, it also hardly makes sense <laughs> in terms of semantic or referential content, right? Looking at the interaction from the perspective of research that emphasizes the ways in which um, nonverbal signals as well as verbal cues serve as bids, right? If anyone is familiar with uh, the research out of the Love Lab in Seattle, um, they often uh, look at um, intimacy as a kind of, um, Gottman really formulates it as a mathematical process by which I make a bid for, for my partner's attention and how many times my partner heeds my bid, like responds, it shows something about the state of our intimacy, right? And, and you can see this, it's like the example of like, look, honey, it's a beautiful bird. You know, and the and uh, and the partner is just kind of zoned out and doesn't care, and then the partner uh, feels like they aren't cared about. So there's a there's a sense to it, um, and it and he's uh, Gottman's lab has shown that this is um, predictive of divorce. However, a lot of those um, relationship uh, research studies attribute. Mm, kinds of interactions. They say that something is a conflict, something is a bid, something is a, an agreement, something is a, and linguistic anthropologists are far more reticent to identify types of interaction as we are um, uncomfortable with identifying where emotion is. So they would code for emotions, explicit specific emotions expressed by individuals, whereas the Lingath point, point of view is, is how does emotion co-emerge across bodies as an intersubjective phenomenon. Um, so we have a very different coding system. But if we were to look at this as uh, from the perspective of bids, at, which contribute to lower relationship satisfaction, um, all of these um, might be considered um, non-responses, right? If, if she's seeking attention, like I'm, I'm doing this on my phone, and um, the four second pause is a very significant pause. We rarely in, in affiliative interaction have four seconds pass between us uh, before he turns to her and says what. Um, and then when he says later on, what is that? Uh, she, um, had, there's a deep sigh and she rolls her eyes. So is that a response? It, it, or is it, is it kind of non-response where she says something, right? And then, um, even, even in the case where she uh, talks about how, you know, it takes me about two hours. Um, you know, I know I don't look like it every day, but it takes me forever, right? And that might be seen as a, as a bid um, for him to perhaps say, no, you look great, right? But, uh, but he doesn't respond to it at all. So from that perspective, you might uh, be, uh, be tempted to uh, draw a conclusion that this is a, a negative interaction. I mean, it, it really just, uh, the strong in-phase synchrony, you know, we could relate it to the literature that says 
that that leads to poor outcomes. But taking a cooperative approach to this um, really gives a different perspective. Um, so that this, uh, we, um, we can reframe using uh, Merleau-Ponty's notion of a phonetic gesture which is a relationally situated sound that affords mutually coordinated forms of experience rather than communicating explicit content. And from this vantage point, a consistent relational ground emerges over the first part of the interaction and becomes, it becomes kind of more explicit or semantic when Wesley asked Gloria what she was looking at on her phone. Um, though she did not look up at him or speak, her dramatic eye roll here served as a response that caused him to chuckle as she offered an even more ambiguous response, something, right? And uh, laughter, really, this overlapping laughter, this is where, I guess it lines up here, but in the, in, in the transcripts, the at symbols are laughter. And um, laughter in conversation, a lot of research has shown constitutes a very important interactional resource for pursuing as opposed to conveying affiliation and intimacy. Matched laughter, moreover, has been shown to occur frequently in affiliative interactions. So even without explicit content, the collaborative, collaboratively enacted activity of chuckling together here functions to direct the embodied conversation away from content, instead continuing to center it on as a process of intercorporeal synchrony. We can thus observe through the first part of the segment how Gloria and Wes engage in a non-referential process of int intimate kind of rhythmic attunement that, um, and their utterances, though non-referential and seemingly non-responsive, here create an embodied soundscape, right? Where as a, as a rhythmic, phonetic, and embodied play that informs um, the, uh, that is informed by also the negotiation of the multiple concurrent interactions that each partner is involved in, including uh, Gloria's interaction with her phone, Wesley's interaction with the TV, and both of their perhaps more implicit interactions with us, with co-present researchers. So from this vantage point and alongside the high in phase RSA linkage, the moment when Gloria reaches up to touch Wes's face, it might be seen as a culmination of what has already been a very intimate interaction rather than you know you could see it as a as a repair as a kind of seeking after after all these misbids a repair we want to actually connect now but here you can see it more as a ramping up of an intimate encounter um, and his response um, which does not address her concerns about how good she looks you know or how long it's taken her how how the way she looks reflects how long it's taken her to get ready. Um, he does respond to her touch, right? So touch as Goodwin and um, Sakate, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I apologize. Uh, 2018 note, it's Osta is, is, is the scholar's first name, is not experienced, touch is not experienced as a single physical modality, but rather effectively as an emotion. Um, so further pointing to the ways in which this couple embraced an understanding of intimacy that did not always require verbal interaction, but did require a form of embodied presence and patience, the combined analyses of, of Gloria and Wesley's interaction and their RSA values suggest how this couple oriented towards an intimate ideal of continuous connection that required moment-to-moment -moment enactment of embodied vulnerability, but did not necessarily hinge so much upon referential content. So that's um, that's where she shifts the topic, but his his response is to her um, to her touch. Okay, so example two, um, Eileen and Vlad, uh, a white couple who uh, uh, declined to allow video. So I'm gonna play the audio, but these are some um, some anonymized uh, clips of the interaction that we're looking at. Um, they'd been together for more than 10 years at the time we interviewed them. They met online um, when they'd both been living in a large Midwestern city. And despite the fact that Vlad was more than 10 years older than Eileen, they had been immediately attracted to one another and had maintained a long distance relationship for a year before Eileen relocated to live with him. Um, and according to their um, 
to their surveys, they both were highly satisfied in their marriage, um, as were as were Gloria and Wesley. Um, and uh, Eileen and Vlad, in their interview, shared with us um, what seemed to be a relationship narrative that really emphasized their differences, including their age. Rather than making these into disputes, however, Eileen and Vlad agreed upon almost everything. One difference that they enthusiastically agreed upon was their propensity to talk or interact with others. Eileen's position as the quote unquote extroverted one in the relationship thus came up numerous times. When Vlad shared that Eileen tended to talk about four times more than he did, she agreed immediately grounding her role as the talker in purported research findings that suggest women talk at least twice as much as men do. Though multiple studies have decidedly disconfirmed this relationship between gender and language, uh, the popularized notion that women speak more than men uh, seemed to constitute a, a scientific point of reference for Eileen and Vlad that was really meaningful. Um, though they joked about their differences, they also highlighted parallels in the way they think about politics, religion, pop culture, um, and the fact that they both oriented explicitly to an overall rational scientific approach that issued, issued religion, right? And they shared numerous hobbies, including a passion for cooking and watching cooking competitions. Um, they also highlighted in their interview their sense of intimacy and connectedness in several ways. Um, they said that they have great chemistry and that when they go out together, they, they can have fun wherever they are. Um, when they do go out, Eileen added, they're those people in Eileen's words, we're like those people. She said, we'll go to a party and he'll make a plate and we'll both eat off the same plate. Like, you know, we're those people. But she added, we're not so much a unit that we can't be separate. We can also go our separate ways and it's okay. So on the evenings we were with them, Eileen typically, Eileen and Vlad typically cooked dinner, ate together and then sat watching TV um, or working on their individual laptops. And the following interaction occurred on the first day that we were with them at around seven in the evening. They were in the kitchen preparing dinner, each engaged, engaged in separate tasks with their backs to one another. Um, and at one point, Eileen moved towards Vlad who was facing the stove and she turned her head slightly towards his back and initiated a conversation by telling Vlad about an email she had received. Oh, did I tell you, AOM sent out the official call for submissions and everything? Oh, yeah. Deadline's January 15th. That's not bad, actually. It's a few days later than normal. Usually it's been more like the 10th or the 12th. Oh, yeah. I mean, that means everyone will totally fucking procrastinate till after New Year's and be like, oh, shit, well, AOM! You know, gotta do something. It's Christmas and New Year's and... Well, I wrote the... Lions, um, tigers, and bears, oh, I, my. I wrote the first draft of the HRMR over Christmas. Because I remember I emailed Dr. Harms on Christmas Eve. And he emailed back. Yeah. I think I told Justin that he informed me that we're both sick people. If you want, we can just have the soup first. Let's do that. I think that, that'll be better because well, we, we can, can just let the steaks rest. So here is their RSA. The correlation coefficient for this is, point, is negative 0 0.03. They are not in synchrony at all. And at first, um, we thought that this mirrored the interaction in which each partner was continually engaged in separate tasks, kind of um, having two conversations at the same time where, where he's kind of interacting with her, but not, um, but, but then switches um, and, and he keeps moving away. I don't know if you saw this, the kind of sequence. Um, again, it's important to note that the, oops, that the randomly selected um, segments showed absolutely um, no co consistent coherent pattern from them. Um, so, you know, in interpreting the interaction, we um, we really want to foreground the uh, the fact that they were engaged in a joint activity, dinner prep, and it seems um, like they're doing two different things, uh, wherein Eileen is enacting the role of talker or storyteller and Vlad responds minimally only like, oh yeah, offering what we call continuers, which function to seed the floor, to, con to confirm that he is seeding the floor to her, right? The conversation peaks with a moment of chuckling from Vlad in response to Eileen's observation that everyone will totally fucking procrastinate, um, right? And um, this progresses to a rapid back and forth uh, leading to 
uh, Vlad's invocation of the Wizard of Oz with his Christmas and New Year's and, uh, and another interjection um, where Eileen goes on telling her story while Vlad seems to be increasingly distracted by the task at hand and issuing only a minimal continuer um, and it was spoken with a downward intonation. Yeah, so it, it kind of sounds distracted. Um, when she has seemingly concluded her recounting, he does turn towards her for a moment, meeting her gaze briefly before shifting topics. And he directs the conversation then towards the soup. And in, he says, if you want, we can just have the soup first, where he points to the soup and they both gaze towards it. Um, and this is a phrase, if you want, we can just have the soup first that we talk about is preferring a yes answer, right? It, it's the kind of thing like um, where you have questions that prefer a no or prefer a yes. And this prefers a yes and he gets it, let's do that. Um, and uh, backpedals, right? Attempting to propose an alternative. You guys catch that, the or. Um, and Eileen offers him no room to do so, immediately launching into an argument for eating the soup first, which she thinks will be better. Vlad tries again, we could. Eileen continues, however, notably drawing upon terminology that, sh that invokes their shared culinary interests. They can just let the steaks rest. Um, after a brief pause, she seems to insist that Vlad is not yet convinced. She then shifts, offering um, an experiential argument grounded in reason, right? The soup, then we can just enjoy the soup and eat it while it's hot. So she's, she's trying multiple different arguments. Um, in the midst of the argument um, that Vlad, um, still not entirely convinced, turns away from Eileen to walk towards the steak. And it, it, he, he literally walks over, so that's his hot picture, and looks at the steak to investigate whether her reasoning is scientifically um, adequate to, to, to eat the soup first, right? So arguably it appears to be an instance of Eileen kind of railroading Vlad with her, with her um, talking. Um, he couldn't get a word in edgewise it seemed like at the end especially. Um, this investigate, the investigation he conducts really offers a very different perspective on the interaction as an, as an affiliative collaborative decision-making project grounded in multiple familiar ways that the couple has had developed of doing being a couple, as well as shared orientations to gender, personality, and the world, including their shared orientation towards reasoning, their shared passion for food and cooking, and their respective identities with regards to gendered norms, um, uh, supposed gender norms regarding talk. So, um, so for Eileen and Vlad, uh, the, the quotidian routine of preparing a meal scaffolds what is um, actually an intimate interaction, um, even while both physiologically and seemingly, at least at, at the first layer discursively, they appear to be in entirely separate worlds. <clears throat> so coming back to this, thinking about um, physiological asynchrony, we might then turn to research that has found a link between asynchrony and intimacy, the provocative thing here though, however, would be to consider the ways in which the cooperative analysis of interaction leads us to question the fundamental ways in which we understand embodied interac interaction as a co-emergent physiological process that occurs between bodies. We might question the stimulus response framework, for example, in terms of the, the time scale within which uh, physiological interaction unfolds. From here, we might also be able to ask when is an interaction? So what we might be seeing here is, uh, is uh, the result and the residue from each of their days, right? It may actually be that they have very different um, physiologies that when they're together, they can be themselves. You know what I mean? It's, there's, there's a lot here that really um, puts into stark relief the problems and challenges of conducting research on physiology and concurrent interaction in terms of understanding where the stimulus is and what the response is. Um, but 
So despite the apparent randomness, there may be a collaboratively emergent pattern that involves somehow at the broader scale moving in and out of some kind of synchrony in phase, antiphase, and asynchrony that itself is more of a meta pattern of intimacy rather than particular moments, right? Because we're looking at couples, this is, this is an, an incredibly um, uh, rich opportunity to see, you know, these, these are folks who interact every day. Um, we may, we, it, this also brings up the very notion of intimacy in the sense of it being an ongoing and emergent form of embodied relationality. So uh, lots to discuss here. Um, in a nutshell, the integrated biolinguistic approach um, demonstrates that physiological measurement is not actually an outcome, nor does it necessarily predict how intimacy will unfold in particular interactions or over time, but it does offer insight into intimacy as a complex, culturally situated, temporally unfolding series of simultaneously embodied and interactive encounters and events. And it further suggests the importance of understanding how intimacy is continually shaped by and grounded within partners shared and sometimes not shared relationship to cultural ideologies, which frequently change over time. So, um, just uh, in, in this sense, one of the um, interventions developed by Sabina Perino and myself in 2020, uh, which we call scalar intimacy, um, involves movements both towards and away. It's, it's, it's how culture is felt as inside of the body self, and it refers specifically to the discursive and socially embedded processes by which people position themselves as embodied moral, emotional, and social beings, vis-a-vis -vis not just other humans, but also multiple culturally salient models of the self, family, and nation. So for Gloria and Wesley, they, they're scaling their interaction in relation to a shared ideology of continual embodied connectedness, perhaps orienting away from the referential content ideology that many of us deploy in, um, in, in other conversations. Eileen and Vlad, on the other hand, um, scale themselves. So you know, as if science is here and religion is here, they, they're here, right? And so they're both in this shared relationship to science and these shared ideologies of gender, whether or not those are scientifically accurate um, and reason. And in co-aligning towards that, they have an intimate interaction in deciding whether they should eat the soup or the steak first. Um, and so the implications here are that intimacy must be engaged as it emerges differently in both interactional and physiological terms over time. So our next step, of course, is to expand beyond uh, these focal interactions. Um, and the other question that, that I am particularly compelled by is how might research include experiences and interactions beyond the diet, like beyond the home, right? So that, so that we can perhaps get a better sense of what what some of those physiological residues that we're, see, that we're reading in the physiological data in the evening um, that come from experiences during the day, right? A, a good day at work, a bad day at work, a, a particularly um, difficult you know, driver on the road home. Like, you know, the body is, has traces in, in terms of physiology of, 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 of interactions and encounters that have happened prior to the immediate encounter. So how might we expand a biolinguistic approach? Um, this is a very brief introduction to my current um, project, which is funded by an NSF Career Award um, on uh, an emerging field called embodied social justice, which refers to a range of practices focused on transforming the effects of injustice in individual social bodies. So very much looking at the residues of experiences of, of oppression um, it, over time as they show up in particular interactions, right? So, um, so the methods we can, you can ask me more about this, but it includes interviews, video recording, um, mobile psychophysiology and, uh, and um, participant-driven mobile ethnography. It was, I, I thought that sounded more, um, more professional than, um, than you know, iPhone ethnography or something. But, uh, but we're using a time capsule approach with participant collaborators and their partners in over 10 days in 10 different sites. So they're, they're doing these recordings themselves and um, we're collecting 
uh, physiology. And the hope is to get a glimpse into the everyday lived embodied relational experience of individuals actively working on rescaling their own and others' relationships to cultural structures. So I'm, I, my particular interest, uh, though I'm still very compelled by all the analyses we can conduct with the couples, um, is in this sort of uh, relationship, that intimacy with cultural ideologies and state authorities and, and how, that in, how that infuses our, our interactions with our partners over time, especially if we, you know, if Eileen were to suddenly become quite religious, um, that might shift the way they interact. So I will end with uh, an invitation. Um, uh, in, in, with the support of my NSF career, I have um, co-created with the uh, UA Embodiment Communication and Health Open CoLab. And the goal really is to think, feel, and experiment and play together uh, about I think thinking about how to integrate biocultural and linguistic anthropology, but also other disciplines in specific research project, projects and applied programs um, in creative ways that bring uh, embodied experience, physiology, and the study of interaction together. And um, this is our website. It is uh, just, if you look it up, it, and it's on my people.ua. We, we meet weekly, and it is hybrid, and I invite everyone um, to attend, and uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sonia. This was really, really interesting, and I want us, um, or I want you to talk a little bit more about, I mean, because I want you to explain to us why these relationships are so important, because when we saw the example of the first couple, mm -hmm. And you talk about, which I, I really loved, the em, embedded soundscape, right? So basically, um, as you very well said, the denotation didn't make sense, but yet they created this, this melody almost, right? Mm -hmm. In which they were attuned. Mm -hmm. I wonder though if, I mean, we could probably have seen that without the needs of the, I mean, whatever, you know, the. Um, the, the term, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, just by looking at the at the transcript, right? Sure. I mean, so I want you to to tell us a little bit more about why this matters, which I I know, but I just want to. <laughs> My, my plans. Thank you, Shoshi. I, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a provocative question. Um, sometimes with science, it matters because it's cool science and we're answering cool questions. And um, I think it matters in terms of existing literature on um, understanding intimacy as a physiological process that sometimes involves synchrony and sometimes involves asynchrony and sometimes involves Antiphase, and I think there's this desire among in the in the in the framework of lab science um, to sort of um, create a generalizable um, link between a certain kind of physiology, uh, a, a certain kind of synchrony, and a certain quality of intimacy. And I think that's a dangerous goal in terms of um, the way it often leads to prescriptive um, pedagogical, pedagogical uh, programs for doing intimacy well. You know, the science of intimacy, how to have a good relationship with your partner. Um, and it negates what I think, perhaps some of the biases that inform the interpretation of interaction. Um, so for those who would, uh, be inclined to look for denotational meaning or referential meaning and content and to looking for bids and specific emotions, they would, they would miss. It's hard to believe once, because once I, once I share our analysis, you can't see it on any other way, but I think, I think that might be missed. And I think, um, you know, of course, in sharing one uh, white couple and one black couple, I want to steer away from any racialized, um, you know, interpretations. Um, but there are, you know, many uh, folks who have written about how those programs for understanding and doing intimacy well in healthy ways for the body are based in weird science, right, who, which is 90% upper middle class white people in Seattle and how their bodies may respond to 
certain types of interaction um, are very, very different. And so without racializing these examples, um, I, I think that what we show among uh, different white couples and black couples and Asian couples, um, and we did not have any same gender couples, um, but you know, is, is, this, is this wild variability um, and so this semantically fixed uh, linkage between a certain kind of physiology as the mechanism, the neural underpinnings by which intimacy occurs and intimacy is always good uh, is a dangerous paradigm for, for, for being able to scientifically investigate the, the, the variation in ways of doing being intimate. And it also misses the, um, what happens beyond the dyad, right? How many uh, couple interactions may be physiologically reflective of disparate experiences that each couple has had during the day that don't necessarily reflect problem in their relationship. So it's very dyadically focused in ways that I, that I consider problematic um, or potentially problematic. I think they can contribute. Those kinds of studies do contribute a great deal. But I think when paired with more ethnographic um, investigations of the variance that happens over time um, within a, 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 in a couple's home, you know, they're not taken outside the lab, they're in a home. And so there's a certain amount of comfort there. I tell you, they, the, you know, especially couples with kids got very quickly used to us and we're not performing much because they have, it's urgent. You gotta watch, you got get the kids in the bath. You gotta make dinner. I mean, we're not that interesting. We're a bunch of, you know, UA researchers with video cameras. It's like, we became friends. And, um, and so, yeah, does that answer? A lot of work in phenomenology, but in a different field of philosophy. So it's fascinating. Can you talk a little bit more? You know, it, just to go to the simple analogy in music, you don't know, really, music is boring. Get to synchrony relationships. You think that, um, so you're talking about more cooperative relationships um, as cooperative that could have a um, I think of, you know, a lot of relationships where it was all. I can, I, I'll try and summarize. Uh, I, 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 I feel like I know what you're going, but. Hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now I have the power. Yes, um, struggle for power, yes. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, you know, you think everything from, you know, a partner comes home and they're sad or tired and you try to jazz them up. You know, and so you're not synchronized, you're deliberately trying to get them to shift, you know, or you have a conflict of perspective on how to raise kids, anything on what's important, like spending two hours really on your clothing or, yeah, yeah. you know, where you're, so there's a constant struggle or back and forth. And I don't know if that would be exactly synchrony, synchrony with a resonance with dissonance. I mean, what does that? Mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, show to you, we got to write, write the dissonance down. <laughs> um, because because um, I think from a, uh, we have another example of a couple um, bickering. Um, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting is there's like a time lag delay in phase synchrony. It's, it's not quite counter, but it's like, and we called it tug of war. And um, and through the analysis of um, bickering as uh, a joint activity, like where we orient to how we know how to bicker, I think. Oh yeah, well let's. Um, so so that so that so that would be the cooperative sort of assessment of it doesn't matter. It's not cooperative, I, although. If you if you think about the difference between an argument and bickering, we could we could get into the nuances there. But it, but the fact is like we're both orienting to the fact that we're having an argument right now because I could walk away, and then I'm not cooperative or cooperative. I'm cooperating with you to conflict with you. Like I, I have to care enough to have a fight, right? Um, and and so it, does that kind of get at, at what you're talking about? Well, in terms of of, of the, you know, you'd want to see, 
you know, I, I have, I have theories about what it might mean uh, about, you know, when a partner is sort of overactivated or stressed and you can remain calm, you know, I think that that's, that's really valuable, right? So that, that anti-phase counter-regulation, right? Is, is really valuable in moments. But I think if a partner, you know, if my, if my partner got this huge HSC Hubble Space Telescope proposal grant that he just applied for, and he was really happy, right? And I was like, I'm gonna counter-regulate. I don't want you to be so happy. Like, that's not the right time. Then I go, then I should go in phase, right? I should, I should go up with him or, or should or shouldn't, you know, what, what do couples do is, is what's interesting to me. And how, how is the dissonance we're seeing not related to the actual interaction, right? Like, how is it related to the complexity of what's, of, of, of the readings that the body gives us? Um, it's one of the things I'm eminently interested in is this idea that, that, that lower RSA is, uh, it, it does show that our parasympathetic nervous system is not coming back online to beyond a certain point and for an extended period of time, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to agree that it is uh, one outcome that shows us that that person is not available for connecting with the other, right? That they're, they're so um, triggered that they can't. Um, and that is, um, that is the kind of dissonance that, I, that I'd be very much interested in. And, and, and we've looked at that, like where, um, how, what someone says, pull someone kind of back online in the moment. And when you see that, 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 that shift in, in RSA and it remains at a certain place for a long time and something that the partner says, and then it can come back up, you can say that is an intervention. Like there's something there that isn't a residue. Um, but, but, you know, like heart rate variability, you want more chaos, you want more flexibility, you want to be, to be able to pivot and move and not be affixed. And I, I think that some of these arguments over which one is better, or, or we should have, we shouldn't have to, they're very moral, you know what I mean? Like we shouldn't have conflicts over power. We should have an egalitarian marriage. Well, both of us orient towards that ideal, but in this case, you know, you're feeling eclipsed, uh, you know, by, by a wife that makes more money than you, for example, uh, you know, if, if you, if you had that situation, but that is something that we heard about, um, or, or, uh, someone's feeling, you know, not good enough because their husband is working outside the home and they're at home. And like, so you have these power. So the, the, the point is how we deal with them, right? Not that we shouldn't have them. And the idea that, that this research is meant to show how, how to have like this happy, happy, resonant, you know, brain coupling and we're all flowing together all the time kind of relationship kind of doesn't really actually reflect. The, and I'm thinking immediately of, the book Cooperative Action would be interesting to you because he draws upon, um, you know, some Merleau-Ponty, but shuts with music, right? Like, and in, in that, how do we, how do we um, co connect with like composers who are in, you know, in time um, before us? Yeah. Hey, yeah, thank you uh, again for your talk. Um, I was wondering about methodologically, how you chose to focus on these specific interactions as representations of intimacy, um, and also like how you chose among all of your data, but also how you chose from the examples you had, the two that you showed us today. Um, okay, so I, um, I, 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 told, I, I told you guys to ask about it. I'll be honest with you. These were chosen because we, uh, we're in the midst of data collection, but we had to do a poster. Jason's like, don't tell him. Um, but yeah, but we had to do a poster and that we had promised. And so we asked our GRAs to pick from couples, maybe some focal interactions and we'll go grab the physio. In theory, what we are doing and are engaged in right now is, is um, coding separately the physio and the, and, the, and the video so that we're coding all the activities um, so first layer coding is like cooking dinner, um, watching TV, um, 
phone use. I've, I've become really interested in the way that, that the phone, that, that what we're seeing in couples' home, homes really complicates the ideology that phones are, uh, are devices that, d- that destroy intimacy, you know, that, that necessarily pull us away from, from interacting. Because I think of intimacy as this movement in and out of connection, like it's, it, it's got resonance and dissonance constantly. That's the point. If you have this one way all the time, you're going to have a very frozen, inflexible intimacy that like when COVID hits or when someone has a, a parent uh, who becomes ill or anything happens or loses a job, you're not going to be able to pivot. So I'm actually hoping to see that intimacy um, that healthy intimacy as reflected by the scales, which you've had a question, but people with high quality relationships are able to move a lot between different modes. That said, the the, the interactions um, that we will be focusing on um, will be like someone blinded to the video is coding the physio and, and sees some sort of synchrony pattern or some sort of interesting thing, tags that, and then we go get the video. Someone coding the video sees an interesting interaction or codes for an activity and wants to, wants to do the physio. I, I actually think what's really interesting is we see a lot of synchrony when couples are watching TV. So I'm really interested in pursuing the idea that the TV, the sound of the TV is like an external regulator of the physiology that has less, you know, because that's part of the interaction too. Um, like the music, like if they're listening to music together, maybe they're Maybe they're not synchronizing with each other. Maybe they're synchronizing with the music and that informs their interaction. Yeah, so, so that said, that's the ideal. But in this case, arguably, we pre-coded these three interactions and we asked um, ourselves or GRAs who had been with these couples for really five days. I mean, we're doing intake and then three days of video. And then, and we're, so we're really intimate really quickly. And then we're... Out and we've done some follow up with some couples, where we um, where we then ran and got the physio, right? And what we found was terrifying, and I'll tell you why. Because the um, the couple that was um, original the original flow couple um, who you didn't see here was 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 the couple that said we can have we're so in love we can have fun no matter what we're doing we're, they were they were kind of sort of in that limerence phase still i think um in terms of where they were at and um when they were watching tv their physio was was in flow like this and then this other couple um uh that you didn't see was the the bickersons a uh, joke um jocelyn and tag really spoke in their interview about how they don't agree about anything and they proceeded to argue about their um, their wedding date or the date they got, you know, engaged and, and they just, they sort of oriented to bickering as a shared activity that was like normal and comfortable and intimate to them. And, um, and their physio was literally like this. And then there was Eileen and Vlad who said they could be in different places at different times. And it looks like they're having two different conversations and their physios in two different conversations. So we're like, this is way too neat. Although it was provocative to think about the ways in which these relational identities that we orient to actually inform the way we interact with one another. I, I think there is something to that, but I was the driving force between behind, we've got to go get random samples until we, pre- I'm not going to, we presented it once, people were very intrigued. It was too neat, right? And I was so grateful to find nothing like that in the random, so, so that the couple who bickers all the time had moments of synchrony and asynchrony r- rather than just this, this time lag um, sort of back and forth. It was like their bodies were bickering. <laughs> and, and so, you know, but they had times where they weren't like that and that didn't match their relational narrative so neatly. And so that was like a great relief to me. Like if we, if we had such fixed ideas, I don't know. I think that would just depress me with the world. So that's, that's where we started with these, but, and we've multiple times sort of reflected on the inauthenticity or authenticity of, of, of how we picked these. But given the fact that we're not, we're not working on generalizable, we're looking at case studies, we're looking at uh, case studies that in particular that um, challenge, if not directly contradict 
the findings that have been found in the lab. And so, you know, they're fine. Like that, that if that's if that's what ethnography can contribute, we're not trying to find how intimacy works across a lot of folks, but our three examples um, issue significant challenges to the findings that have been found in, in labs. That was a very long explanation. Uh, justification for we have a poster that we have to present next week and telling our GRAs go get us go get us three interactions and we'll just see we'll just see you know it was like in the first second year of the grant and we're just like really really focused on data collection and recruitment and you know managing a team like a team like 11 12 undergrads like huge it was like a huge thing so so we were not even coding at all like we were you know let's just go grab some physio for these and see what happens and it turned out to be this really interesting thing yeah joe did you have a question hello hello okay it, it's a really simple question it's just about kids like you know when i was sitting here watching these couples as somebody who has young kids mm. feels the freneticism i was like oh i remember those days when i was like kid free and could just have the space to interact in a dyadic way. And I'm just curious since you didn't include anything about couples with kids here, like all of this stuff, how it looks different or similar when there is the chaos of children involved. That's a wonderful question. Um, kids weren't wearing physio. One of the, one of the uh, we had a, what I call the SEC Lingant club, like the, the Southern Lingant um, meeting a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the things that someone asked me is, well, you should be wearing these $20,000 devices, right? And the kids, and we all should, but we don't have that much money, nor do we have that much capacity to analyze that data, right? So, so the fact that we're there, we're not ignoring that fact, but how might that be different without us there is, you know, a question. Um, I think it's better than being in a lab. I think it, it, it's a little more um, what it what it might be at home than in a lab. And and uh, and then with kids, um, so we don't know what the physio is for the kids themselves. But I would say, um, analyzed a ton of interactions with children. They come in and out, especially the young ones. Um, the parents are more or less physiologically frazzled by various types of interactions. Um, they continually are interacting with each other though. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that would be a fascinating um, example of when um, the presence or absence of children, like how that affects, I would imagine that in terms of how the body is is showing the effects of other things with with multiple things going on at once you certainly cannot attribute the physiology to the to the immediate interaction um, and i think engagements where there is a child involved in the direct video um, i think with ling anth we could still very much incorporate the child and and understand you know how the how how um, the couple sort of seeks to maintain connection or conflict or dissonance or resonance or whatever it is, while also trying to get the kid to take a bath. But um, but yeah, I mean, that is a question of, of what do we do with the physiology in that case? Um, we tried to um, get mostly couples without children, in large part because the self-study, the Center for the Everyday Lives of Families that um, Eleanor Oaks um, and then many people also all over the world did when I was at UCLA was um, specifically looking at families with kids and looking at, um, Rena Rapetti was a psychologist involved in that and looked at the, the cortisol and uh, in the couples. And so, um, so we, I, I wanted to, we wanted to focus on, let me get my dyke dick straight. <laughs> we wanted to focus on, um, on, Romantic. I mean, I'm interested. My my copia is at least in theory here with this camera turned off. And um, Jason, do you want to have you thought about um, cases with kids? 
Well, we did have a couple of cases, right? I mean, it, it yeah, was not a couple. something that was part of, in fact, the um, the tug of war couple didn't, didn't uh, their young kids sort of float in and out of that um, interaction? They floated in and out, yep. So, um, I mean, it, it's definitely something that I think we could do a limited investigation of in our own data set. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have all kinds of, thoughts about kids <laughs> um, and, and interaction and uh, a couple interaction. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm, we, we'd have to really, in terms of this particular study, think about how much leverage we have to look at that in any kind of um, meaningful way, given that, as you say, it was, it was a, a smaller subset where kids are in the picture and we weren't um, we actually were sort of trying to avoid having kids in the frame as well, as I recall, in terms of the video recording um, yep. as much as possible. Yeah, and there was, I mean, the, we, we have only looked at um, specifically at interactions between the parents if there, if there are children. But it would be, yeah, put that on the list. We have a long list. <laughs> Thank you. I'm oh, sorry we got started so late. I, I can't believe the, the box thing, but I really love it. And I would love anyone who is interested in popping in to Echo. We have on our website, like the activity for the week. We have a mailing list if you wanna get on that. We have a guest speaker coming up um, this week, Dr. Uh, Gilly Hammer, who works on integrative dance. And uh, she uses a lot of uh, intersubjectivity to understand how in integrative dance where you have differently abled dancers, right? Um, how, how we understand across bodies and ability and like it, there's a lot at stake in terms of how people might get hurt or what, what people can do and how to create aesthetically beautiful performance at the same time. Um, so um, I invite you all to that.